Let us not forget everything that happens. It's by the will of Allah. Holy it's time to unite and stand, and we will be the best amongst men. It's not time to be extreme or duty unthinkable, but to stand together as one. Turn into sooner followers, streaming. Every day, various platforms, trust me, you'll find a way, soon the followers. It all begins Assalamu alaikum. Soon the followers in association with Aris Institute presents it to you an intensive foundation in Islamic studies. We welcome Dr. Ali Shihada, who will be teaching the science of the Quran and the Hadith every Saturday at 11 a.m. Eastern, streaming right here on Sunnah Followers. I think actually, I'm, I'm not sure if... Uh, you guys have this or not but uh, today should be our last session if i'm not mistaken is that right for the first semester is that right zahira uh i'm actually not sure okay it looks like i don't i think that for as far as my notes go that today would be the last uh the last session so i'm not i have to figure out some do you guys just go straight into the second semester directly or is there a break anybody know that's all right so we'll, we'll find out later this week inshallah and I'll, i'm sure it will be communicated to you guys um i know you guys requested um notes and i apologize i've been traveling this week and so i didn't have a chance to sit down but inshallah um, at the conclusion of today, I will send today's notes and uh, tomorrow's uh, and yesterday's notes, inshallah. Uh, today and last week, inshallah. All right. So we have, we're going to get started with Quran then, inshallah. So today um, we're going to talk about um, a very important subject, an nasikh wal matsukh. All right, and this is a very important um, topic to to be aware of, especially for those uh, for the student of knowledge. So the definitions that we have here. So the, we have two Arabic words, nasakh and mansukh. They both come from the root word nasakha, which means to erase or abolish, replace, withdraw. Or the common word that we use in the English language when we're talking about this about this uh, subject, the abr to abrogate. Okay, and so abrogating. Okay, essentially from the Quranic standpoint, it essentially means taking something from the Quran, removing something from the Quran, and replacing uh, replacing it with something else. That's the idea. Taking something from the Quran and replacing it with something else. And this is something that only Allah can do. This is not something for any human being to do. This is only from Allah Azza wa to do. So we have, so when we look at these two words, they are different tenses, okay? So one of them is active, one of them is passive. So nasikh, it means the abrogating. So this is the part of the Quran that will replace. And mansukh is that which is abrogated, which means that which has been erased. Okay, so mansukh is the erased or removed, and nasikh is the replacement. So in technical language, these terms refer to certain parts of the Quran which have been abrogated by others. And so the abrogating passage is mansukh. Okay. No, oh, sorry, this is wrong. My apologies. So the abrogated is the mansukh, okay? And the abrogating one is nasikh, okay? So 
this is pure memorization really there's really nothing else to really to hear to, to to be done here except that you learn these terms by memorization by memorization but the principle again that we want to be aware of is uh what is what the, what these words generally mean okay about removing something from the quran and replacing it with something else so does the quran talk about this topic yes it does so in Surah Al-Baqarah, uh, Allah Azza wa Jalla He says, "Ma nam sakh min ayatin aw nun siha nati bi khayrin minha aw mithliha alam ta'lam an Allah ala kulli shay'in qadir." We do not abrogate a verse or cause it to be forgotten, except that we bring forth one that is better than it or similar to it. Do you not know that Allah is over all things capable? So this ayah gives us the premise or the foundation for the concept of abrogation in the Quran. So knowledge of al-Nasikh wa al-Mansukh is important for the correct and exact application of the laws of Allah because it is a topic which is specifically concerned with legal revelation revelations. So do you so the question that I have for you to make sure that you're with me, can there be an ayah in the Quran dealing with aqidah, dealing with the pillars of faith, something dealing with Allah and his beautiful names, dealing with the worship of Allah dealing with the angels, dealing with the prophets, dealing with the day of judgment, these types of things. Can these ayat have abrogation? Are these types of ayat subject to abrogation? Is it possible that Allah can reveal something about himself and then erase it and replace it with something else? Think yes. Anybody else? So I want you guys to understand why would Allah replace? Is Allah changing? Is Allah changing in his attributes? Is the day of judgment changing in his attributes? No, right? <clears throat> there is no, these things are eternal and they're eternally that way. So these types of uh, subjects, they are never subject to abrogation, never. There is no abrogation regarding Allah Azawajal and his attributes or the attributes of the day of judgment or the angels or these types of things. They're not changing. This subject is something which deals specifically and only with laws. Because laws do change. So Allah Azawajal, he might introduce a law for a temporary period of time and then change that law for a wisdom. You with me? Mariam and Amira, you guys with me? So that's very, very important to understand. And that's why this subject, Nasikh al Mansukh, is something that is very relevant in fiqh. And we'll talk about that, inshallah, in today's Usul al Fiqh session about why this, this is something that's very critical. Okay. So, why are some ab ayat abrogated? We already kind of approached the subject. So, when Islam was presented to the Arabs, it was introduced in stages. The Quran brought important changes gradually to allow the people to adjust to the new prescriptions. Okay, so for example, there are three ayat in the Quran as it stands now concerning the drinking of wine. Okay, wine drinking was something that was very widespread in the Jahiliyyah, in the times before Islam. So Allah, he revealed certain ayat 
or or he revealed something about these ayat. in stages to give people the time in order to you know to give people the time to uh, adjust to give people time to get used to that okay so for example the very first ayah regarding the prohibition of alcohol was in surah an nisa ayah 43 so allah he says ya la taqrabu salata antum sukara o you who believe do not approach the prayer when you're drunk. So it forbid the person to come to the prayer uh, when they're drunk. So that's the first stage. So when if a person cannot come to the prayer drunk, does that mean they have to stop drinking altogether? Okay, so explain. It does limit the time of drinking. Very good. So they cannot drink after the prayer, really, unless we're talking about drinking after Salat al -Aisha. So the idea is that some person says, okay, I can't really drink during the day because the Salah are, are very close to each other. Okay? So either I can only drink after Fajr or after Aisha because that way I will be able to sober up before the next prayer comes. But when Dhuhr, you don't have time. Dhuhr is not enough time between Dhuhr and Asr to become sober. De definitely not enough time between uh, Maghrib and Asha, or from Dhuhr, uh, uh, Asr to, uh, to Maghrib. There's not enough time. So it isolates the periods of time in which a person can drink. And so it limits them. Then the next ayah was in Surah Al-Baqarah. Where Allah he talks, uh, he, he limits it again. Okay. And then finally, in Surah Al Ma'idah, where Allah Azza wa Jal, He completely prohibits it altogether. All right. The complete prohibition of alcohol, in which Allah Azza wa Jal, He tells us that it is something from the shaitan. Okay. So, of course, the believer is not going to do it. Okay, so here Allah is really, he's telling us that it's the shaitan, he is trying to sow between you division and hatred through alcohol and gambling and to prevent you from the remembrance of Allah and to prevent you from your prayer. So will you not then give it up? And so as a result, we see here the the final prohibition that is not allowed. And so what's the purpose of this stage is to allow people to approach them. So we talked about it before when you compare the prohibition of alcohol in Islam to the prohibition of alcohol in the United States. We see that the prohibition of alcohol in Islam, because it was done in stages, it was successful. Whereas the prohibition of alcohol in the United States, for example, it was a massive failure and it actually led to the increase in drinking of alcohol. More people were drinking alcohol after their prohibition than before, which is a, a disaster. And that is because they didn't, they, they tried to cut it off <clears throat> immediately <clears throat> without recognizing that people need time. So can this be implemented today? This is a very important question. So somebody becomes Muslim, okay? Somebody becomes Muslim. Is there a way for me to benefit from this? Because the question we want to understand, okay, well, you know, I, we know that, we know that, for example, that, uh, you know, I mean, we're, we're not allowed to drink as Muslims. So why would Allah leave this ayah about don't come to the prayer when you're drunk? What's the value of leaving these ayat?
it can teach us the things that, but why leave the, the evidences for that there? It can, it can be a reminder, but there is usually more to it than that. Okay, there's more to it. And so, we, yes, we can see they adopted to it, but this can also be done historically. Remember that the Quran, there, every every word, it has value. You know what I'm saying? So Allah doesn't, so just leave something in the Quran of uh, this much information. There's, there's three ayat here, okay? They're talking about it. Why leave all that? There's more to it than that. So and there's something that, that should be learned here, especially when it comes to dealing with new Muslims. So right now, as an example, I know I know that my neighbor, as an example, he drinks alcohol. Okay? Every weekend, he goes outside and he grills uh, hot dogs and hamburgers and he drinks beer. Okay? And I want him to become Muslim. Should I go and talk to him about alcohol? Should I go and tell him, you know what? I really wish you would become a Muslim, but you know, when you become Muslim, you're not going to be able to drink beer anymore. Good. I shouldn't be talking to him about that. That's very, very important. And so the issue is, is that we, not maybe, definitely we're going to start with the Tawheed. Like we said that Mu'ad ibn Jabal, when he was sent by the Prophet Sallallahu to the people of Yemen, he was sent with specific instructions and he was told, call them to the worship of Allah alone, without partner. If they accept that, then tell them that Allah has obligated upon them five daily prayers. If they accept that, then tell them that they have to pay zakah, that it's taken from their rich and given to their poor. Step by step, okay? And so this is very, very important is that if somebody, if I know somebody is drinking alcohol and I'm trying to talk to them about Islam, I'm going to talk to them about Islam. What happens is, what happens if, for example, they are still in the early stages of Islam and they, I go, go to visit him and he says, hey, welcome, I'm glad you came to visit. I'm going to have a beer right now. You want one? Should I go and tell him that this is haram right away? And this is, again, this is something for a new Muslim we're talking about. I, no, we shouldn't be understanding if he wants to drink it. When he knows it's haram, we shouldn't be understanding. So it, it's when some, when a Muslim knows that something is haram, then we, we don't tolerate that, okay? So remember that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, you know, one of the reasons that the um, the, the Jewish people were, were punished was because they would advise their people regarding sin in the morning, and they would sit with them in the afternoon while they were still sinning. Okay, they hadn't uh, they hadn't left the sin. So as Muslims, we're not going to sit with people <clears throat> or or tolerate when people are continuing to sin when they know it's a sin. So the concept though here, what I'm trying to explain to you is that sometimes we rush people into things. We rush people into things, especially as new Muslims. Um, so a person who becomes a Muslim, so a lot of times the person he didn't even learn to pray yet, and we're already telling them, you know, you're, you don't wear these types of shirts, and you know, you have to uh, change your house, and you have to change your job, and you have to change, and you have to change. It becomes too much, and the person says, oh, I didn't know it was so much to do. I, I don't think I want to be a Muslim anymore. So the idea of the graduality of it. There's a very important lesson for us in how we approach new Muslims. So when somebody, I know somebody drinks, okay, and they're still learning about Allah, and they still haven't even started praying yet, or basically they just started praying yet, then I will go with them gradually. I'm not going to hammer on them right away with these types of things, because these are the things that might cause them to, to leave.
So in the same way that Allah taught us, okay, they can't go to the prayer drunk. Tell them, you know what? Hey, you're, you're still learning to pray. Um, you can't come to the prayer when you've been drinking alcohol. Oh, okay, well, then I, I have to limit my drinking. Step by step by step. It's like someone right now who's smoking. I'm going to tell him, you can't smoke anymore. How many people succeed in quitting smoking in uh, like overnight? Very good. So that becomes a very important. So this is the, the value of being careful with that. There is no time frame. There is no specific time frame. But because remember that the Prophet I sent them, he told them, go and teach them that there's nothing worthy of worship except Allah when they accept that. So if a person, some people will accept it immediately. Some people accept it right then and there. Some people, you have to keep talking to them for one year. Some people, they may not accept it for 10 years or 20 years, okay? So everybody's a little bit different when it comes to this issue. So you have to be careful. Just give them the time. Be aware of this. Be aware of this principle and don't rush people in to this, this idea. Now, Make sense? When a person, though, has already accepted Islam and they are practicing Islam fully, when a person has, become, has accepted Islam fully, okay, and so now they're praying, alhamdulillah, they're, they're established, then, they, then the, uh, the issue of commanding good and forbidding evil applies to them like it applies to anybody else, okay? Commanding good and forbidding evil applies to them like it applies to anybody else. Then every, all the rulings of Islam apply to them, and I cannot, you know, kind of, you know, be gentle with them or on, on something like this, okay? So this is the kind of the wisdom that comes with Dawah, uh, is not bringing up issues before the person is ready for them. That's, the, that's one of the ideas and one of the benefits of leaving these ayat in the Qur'an so that people can benefit from seeing this, this, um, uh, this stratification or this staging so that they also don't push people. Just like the Sahaba, they weren't pushed by uh, by Allah. The new Muslims shouldn't be pushed either. They have to be approached gradually. All right, so the uses of Nasikh and Mansukh. How do we use this concept today, all right, uh, in, in fiqh? So it's one of the important prerequisites for explanation of the Qur'an. A person cannot be a scholar in tafsir, until they understand Nasikh and Matsukh. Uh, it's also one of the very important prerequisites for understanding and applying the Sharia, as I said, the rulings of Islam. It's important for understanding the historical development of the legal code. It is important uh, for understanding the immediate meaning of an ayah. And as we'll talk later today, uh, the legal ruling or the tafsir of somebody who doesn't know this information, okay, is not acceptable. So, like Asbab al Nuzul, what's Asbab al Nuzul? Who can remind me? This is something we talked about before. Okay, good. So this is the reasons behind the revelation of certain parts of the Quran. Okay, the reasons behind the revelation of certain parts of the Quran. So in a similar way, so these two things, Nasikh and Mansukh and Asbab and Nuzul, they're similar in the sense that these topics have to be based on reliable reports, which should go back to the Prophet Sallallahu and his companions. This is not something that can be you know, uh, reported uh, after them, okay? So the report must also clearly state which part of the revelation is 
replacing and which part is being replaced. Which part is Nasik and which part is Mansu. So three ways of knowing about this subject. Number one, from the report of the Prophet Sallallahu or his companions, a, a uh, consensus of the scholars, Ijma, or thirdly, knowing which part of the Qur'an preceded another part in the history of the revelation. All right, so just to make sure that you're with me, which one comes first in, in terms of uh, chronologically, okay, in the history of the Qur'an? The Nasikh or the Mansukh? Which one comes first? The Nasikh or the Mansukh? The Mansukh. Very good. Excellent. The Mansukh, because that is which is abrogated. And so you will find the Nasikh, which is replacing it, it will come later. Very good, Amir. Everybody good on that? All right, so here is another example from the Qur'an, okay? وَالَّذِينَ يُتَوَفَّوْنَ مِنْكُمْ وَيَذَوْنَ أَزْوَاجَ يَتَرَبَّصْنَ بِأَنفُسِهِنَّ أَرْبَعَةَ أَشْمَرٍ وَعَشْرًا As for those of you who die and leave widows behind, let those widows observe a waiting period of four months and ten days. Okay? So this ayah, it talks about the waiting period, okay, so the woman cannot get married for four months and ten days, but also that after this period of time, there was really no limitation on the woman, okay, so after the four months and ten days, she is living in the home of her husband who has passed away for four months and ten days, and after that four months and ten days, uh, she can go on and, and kind of live her life, okay? Then Allah revealed later, okay, uh, more detail on this subject to remove this uh, limitation. Okay. So those of you who die leaving widows should bequeath for them a year's maintenance without forcing them out. All right. So the question then here, what does it mean bequeath for them a year's maintenance? Like provide for them? Uh, yes, provide for them. But what is the bequeath part? Because the person is dead, okay, so he cannot provide, um, he cannot actively provide. Maybe it's like telling the family, the ones like the relatives to take care of the wife. So this is the wasiya, okay, so the word bequeath is the wasiya, which is part of the will, okay. So the, in the Islamic will, all right, there is a sharia division of the the deceased's property, okay. So does the wife, okay, does she get part of that was uh, of the uh, of the the division? Of course, okay, she has an allotted share, okay. So, but that allotted share is just her money, okay, that's being given to her. So the wasiya is something which comes before the division according to the Sharia. So a person can 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 uh, bequeath, okay, things to their friend. Uh, their neighbor, their teacher, anybody, okay? So it's, it's saying here that the righteous person should include in the in this wasiya that the wife has enough money to take, to take care of herself for at least one year, okay? That she will not be, you know, out on the street type of thing, that she has enough money to take care of herself at least for one year. And this is separate from her inheritance, separate from the Sharia division, which is the inheritance, okay? So this is important. Um, this is the wasiyah, okay? So does that make sense to you guys? Yes. Come on, come on.
Zahira, you're good. Mariam, you're good. It's me, Zahira, on the voice. I'm so sorry, my okay. life. Okay. <laughs> I th okay, and uh, very good, alhamdulillah, good, good. So uh, that's the principle. So the initial ayah, it said that they have, essentially, that there's four months and ten days that they're cared for, and then another ayah came and said, it's better that you should take care of them for one year. So which one is the nasikh and which one is the mansukh? And Zahir, it's okay to reply by voice. I don't mind. I just, usually, Amir is the one that responds by voice. That's why I was. Uh, I thought it was her. Uh, the mansuk should be the four days and ten, uh, four months and ten days, and then yes. like the nasik would be the the one year's maintenance. Very good. Okay, so this is an example. Okay, another example. So we have the example of alcohol. We have the example of the maintenance of the of the widow. So what can be abrogated, okay? There is a difference of opinion on this subject, okay? Um, and so there is there's no difference of opinion at all that the Qur'an can abrogate the Qur'an. There is no difference of opinion on that, okay? Because that's what we've been talking about, and the Qur'an specifically talks about this issue, okay? So um, the Qur'an can abrogate the Sunnah, Okay, there's also generally almost no difference of opinion on that. And there is some difference of opinion on the, the next two. Okay, can the Sunnah abrogate the Quran? Generally, yes, it, it, there is, because remember, they're both revelation. The Quran and the Hadith, they're both revelation, they're both Wahi. Okay, and so there is no, there should be no problem or there should be no, um, you know, uh, Concern that the, that the that the Sunnah is abrogating the Quran. There should be because they're both they're both revelation, so it shouldn't be a, something to to be a bother, uh, or somebody should not be bothered about that. And then lastly, the Sunnah can abrogate the Sunnah, of course. Okay, and so we will look at examples of all of these now. So three kinds of nasq in the Quran. All right, so abrogation of the recited ayah together with the legal ruling or it could be abrogation of the legal ruling without the recited ayah or abrogation of the ayah without the legal ruling okay so in the first case both the ayah and its ruling are abrogated both the ayah and its legal ruling they're erased there is no no further need for them either of them in the second case, the legal ruling is erased, but the ayah remains. And in the last case, the ayah has been erased, but the legal ruling remains. So let's take some a look at that. Here is the nasq of the ayah and its legal ruling. Both of them are erased, okay? So we have in the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu hadith of Aisha, in the Fima Unzila Mil Quran, Ashro Rodaatin, Madumatin, Yuharam, Thumma Nusichna, Behamsin, Madumatin, Fatuufi, Rasulullah, his Allah, he was Sandam, Wahuna Fima, Yukorao, Mil Quran. So Aisha, she reports on this authentic hadith. It has been revealed in the Quran that ten clear feedings. Oh, we're talking about breastfeeding right now. Okay. So the woman breastfeeds the child fully 10 times. Okay. In that case, it makes marriage unlawful. Marriage unlawful between who and who? The children of the woman? Like the children of the, of the woman who is breastfeeding. Exactly. So because that child that that infant now becomes her child through breastfeeding. And that means that her children are his brothers and sisters through breastfeeding. So it become marriage becomes unlawful between these people. Then this con this uh, ruling about ten feedings was abrogated and substituted by five feedings, okay, instead of ten. And Rasulullah died, and it was before that time found in the Quran and recited by the Muslims. 
Okay, so here the ayat that talk about this issue were removed. And the ruling about 10 feedings was also removed. So the ruling about five feedings, how do we have it right now? Since it was, uh, there's there's no ayah in the Quran that talks about five feedings establishing, um, uh, establishing uh, uh, the mahram status. So where do we get this ruling from as Muslims today? So right now, I it is a ruling Islamically. It is part of the Sharia that if a woman breastfeeds a child five times, uh, the child becomes full five times, then that child is now uh, considered her child through breastfeeding. He still has his own mother and father, but she is now his mother through breastfeeding. And he has the mother that gave birth to him. So he has two mothers now. Where do we get this idea from as Muslims since it's not in the Quran? From the Sunnah? From the Sunnah. We're, we're, and and here, here we are, we're reading it right now. So it's right in front of us, the, the Hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu So we have this. This is only one Hadith of others. And so it is from the Sunnah. So we, it's not preserved in the Quran, but it is preserved in the Sunnah. Okay? So that uh, makes it clear for you. Now we have the nasq of a legal ruling without the ayah. So the ayah remains, okay? The ayah is, is present, but the legal ruling itself the, is, uh, is gone. So we have, in this case, in, uh, in Surah Al-Ahzab, Allah Azza wa he's telling us, in between ayah 50 and 52, we have the nasq and the mansuq here. So... Let us look at the mansukh, which part of it was taken away. And this is going to be Allah's statement where he says, regarding, Ya ayyuhal nabi, inna ahlanna laka azwajaka allati atayta ujurahunna wa ma malakat yaminuk mimma afa Allahu alayk. Wabanati ammika wabanati ammatika wabanati khadika so this lengthy ayah from Surah Al-Ahzab. So Allah is here telling us, telling the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, okay, about the women that he can marry. Okay, and it is not restricted. Allah is not restricting to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, in this case, the, the, the marriage. Okay, so uh, the translation of the meaning, O Prophet, indeed we have made lawful to you, your wives, to whom you have given their due compensation, their dowry, and those your right hand possess from what Allah has returned to you of captives, as well as the daughters of your paternal uncles and the daughters of your paternal aunts and the daughters of your maternal uncles and the daughters of your maternal aunts who immigrated with you and a believing woman if she gives herself to the Prophet I send them if the Prophet wishes to marry her. This is only for you, excluding the other believers we certainly know what we have made obligatory upon them, and so forth. So this ayah talks about the, the kind of a rest, not, a, a showing an unrestricted nature of the Prophet Sallallahu when it comes to marriage. Then we have the ayah that replaces it, okay, just two ayat later, okay. لَا يَحِلُّ لَكَ النِّسَاءُ مِنْ بَعْدُ وَلَا أَنْ تُبَدَّلَ بِهِنَّ مِنْ أَزْوَاجٍ وَلَوْ أَعْجَبَكَ حُسْنُهُنْ so not lawful to you, O Messenger of Allah, are any additional women after this, nor is it for you to exchange them for other wives, even if their beauty was to please you, except what your right hand possesses, and, and Allah is over all things an observer. So, Ayah 52 came to restrict, to tell the Prophet ﷺ that you're, you are not allowed to take any more wives in marriage, whereas Ayah 50, came and uh, gave him that permission, okay? So that's how we have that. So in this case, the legal ruling was removed, but the ayah remains, okay? So which legal ruling was removed? Ayah 50 or ayah 52? 50. 50. Okay, I have 50. That's the one where the legal ruling was removed. Okay, but the ayah remains. 
So I hope it's all clear to everybody. Lastly, we have the abrogation of the ayah, but the legal ruling remains. The ayah itself no longer remains, but the legal ruling remains. Okay. So we have in this hadith in Bukhari this the statement of uh, um, regarding uh, the statement of Al Khattab regarding the punishment of stoning for adultery. Uh, when married people commit adultery, that they should be stoned. Okay, so this has been retained in the Sunnah, but it's not found in the Quran. Similar to what we talk about about five five breastfeeding. Okay. So the, the the when we come back to here, the ten, the ruling of ten feedings is gone, as well as the ayah about ten. Both of them are gone. And the only thing that remained is the ruling of five, which is found in the Sunnah, but there's no ayah. And so the same this is similar to here, where the ruling is um present, but the ayah is no longer present. It's still, but it is found in the hadith. So in this hadith, um, Umar al-Khattab, he sat on the pulpit of the, uh, on the member of the Prophet sallallahu and he said, truly Allah sent Muhammad sallallahu with the truth, and he sent down the book with him, and the verses, the verse of stoning was included in what was sent down to him. We recited it, retained it in our memory, and understood it. Allah's Messenger sallallahu awarded the punishment of stoning to death to the married adulterer and the adulteress, and after him, we also rewarded the punishment of stoning. I am afraid that with the lapse of time, the people may forget it and may say, we do not find the punishment of stoning in the Book of Allah, and thus go astray by abandoning this duty prescribed by Allah. Stoning is a duty laid down in Allah's Book for married men and women who commit adultery when proof is established or if there is pregnancy or a confession. Okay, so this is something found in the hadith of Sahih al Bukhari. So the ruling is still there, but the ayah is gone. And here it is clear from the statement of Omar where he said, We recited the ayah, it retained it in our memory, and we understood it, but it is no longer found in the Quran. Okay, so inshallah, that is clear. In terms of how much is abrogated in the Quran. Shah Waliullah is one of the late scholars, okay, who died in um, 1759. And this is, of course, not the Hijri era, the common era. So he's died, you know, a little over 200 years ago. He's one of the great Muslim scholars of India. He lists that really, he, he, he said that there's pretty much only five ayat, okay, that are genuinely abrogated from the Quran, and he lists them here. And so we've already talked about um, uh, Surah Al-Baqarah, the ayah about the uh, maintenance of the married woman, um, when or the, when she becomes a widow. We talked about Surah, Surah Al-Ahzab, where Allah Azawajal, he limits to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam how many women that he can marry. And there are a few other examples here that you can look at at your own, at your own leisure. Now, Suyuti, one of the um, kind of early scholars of the Quran, um, of, the, of Islam, I'm sorry, is uh, well known for his uh, being a scholar of the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that he um, uh, he thought that there was 21 cases, but Shah Wali Allah, when he was going through the material, um, he really felt that these are the only ones that are truly genuine cases of Nesq, and it makes sense that there shouldn't be so many. It makes sense that there shouldn't be so many, and uh, so it is um, Allah knows best, but this is... Uh, uh, some of the differing views. And so we can see here that there is some difference of opinion on these types of issues. And so this is the subject of Anas Al-Mansukh. I hope that uh, I 
uh, that you understand it better now than before. And I hope that I made it uh, somewhat clear to you. Let me know if you have any questions, inshallah. No questions. Alhamdulillah. Any questions uh, from from Sister Layla? From your your side of things? Mariam, do you have any questions? Okay, inshallah. So for now, we'll take a break, um, 10 minute break, inshallah. We'll start up at the um, beginning of the hour, inshallah. Uh, so that we can start with our uh, al of class, inshallah. Uh, you might be something. unable to answer, but if you are, let me know, inshallah. So uh, today we're going to talk about um, two big topics, which is ijtihad and ifta. And so to begin, inshallah, we'll talk about the definition of ijtihad. So ijtihad is linguistically in the Arabic language, this Arabic word, okay, comes from jahada. Jahada is the root word. And it means to struggle, to strive, to exert a great deal of effort, okay, for something. To exert a great effort or a great deal of effort for something. Technically, or in the Islamic understanding of this word, it means exertion of mental effort by the mujtahid in seeking the knowledge of sharia rulings by extraction. So that the scholar is working hard to extract a ruling from the sharia in regard to something that isn't already black and white are very clear from the Quran and Sunnah. And so Usul al-Fiqh itself is greatly concerned with the topic of ijtihad. And that's one of the reasons that we have Usul al-Fiqh is because of ijtihad. So what is the evidence then for ijtihad? Is there any evidence from the Quran or Sunnah about this? It is validated for sure in the Quran and Sunnah, as well as the practice of the Sahaba. So we have a variety of ayat from the Quran that indicate this to us. Uh, so we have, for example, uh, in the Quran, we have uh, Surah at Tawbah, uh, Ayah 122. We have uh, Surah Al Hashr, Ayah number two. So, we're going to go Surah Al Hashr. We can take a quick look at that uh, as um, what the reference is on that. فرصونهم من الله فآتاهم الله من حيث لم يحتسبوا وقذف في قلوبهم الرعب يخربون بيوتهم بأيديهم وأيدي المؤمنين فاعتبروا يا أولي الأبصار okay so the last part فاعتبروا يا أولي الأبصار this is the uh, the the key the key um, point and so to give you the translation of that, uh, it's my English up here. So at the end of ayah number two, Allah Azza he says, so take warning, O people of vision, or take a lesson. Those of you who have eyes to see, learn from this, okay? This is the statement, فَاعْتَبِرُوا فَاعْتَبِرُوا Okay? So this is considered one of the uh, evidences in the, uh, in the Qur'an uh, for that. If we look at um, Surah at tawbah this is Allah's statement. وَمَا كَانَ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ لِيَنْفِرُوا كَافَّةً 
فلولا نفر من كل فرقة منهم طائفة ليتفقهوا في الدين ولينذروا قومهم إذا رجعوا إليهم لعلهم يحذرون And it is not for the believers to go forth to battle all at once, for there should be a separate group from every division who stay back to obtain understanding in the religion and advise their people when they return to them so that they may be cautious. So these are some of the examples from the Quran. We have the example in the Hadith. Uh, one specific example, the hadith of Amr ibn al-As, which is a hadith that is in Bukhari and Muslim. It is a hadith which is, its authenticity is agreed upon. Muttafaqun Ali, the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu where he says, إِذَا حَكَمَ الْحَاكِمْ فَاجْتَهَدَ ثُمَّ أَصَابَ فَلَهُ أَجْرَانِ وَإِذَا حَكَمَ فَاجْتَهَدَ ثُمَّ أَخْطَأَ فَلَهُ أَجْرَانِ Okay. So in this hadith, we the, the actual word mujtahid is being used. Uh, so the meaning of the hadith, if the um, judge rules on an issue and he exerts his effort, his best effort to make the correct ruling, fajtahada, okay, he makes this effort to give the best ruling. Then he gives the right ruling, then he will have two rewards. And if he rules, and he exerts a great deal of effort to find the correct ruling, but he gives an incorrect ruling, he will only have one reward. So what would be the reward that he has if he gave the wrong ruling? He's going to get a reward for what? One reward for trying? Exactly. One reward for the ijtihad, for making the effort, making the sincere effort, okay, to discern the true ruling. Making a sincere effort to discern the true ruling, then he would get a reward for that. So, uh, so that gives us the uh, understanding. So if he gets the right ruling, he gets a reward for that, as well as the ijtihad, as well as making that effort. So this is something which is uh, supported in the Quran and Sunnah, uh, as uh, can be noted from many scholars that uh, see that case. Um, we have the conditions of ijtihad that are mentioned by Imam al-Shafi'i in his book Al-Risada. لا يحل لأحد أن يفتي في دين الله إلا رجلا عارفا بكتاب الله. So he says that it is not uh, valid for anyone to give a fatwa in the religion of Allah except someone who is knowledgeable, a man who is knowledgeable of the Qur'an. And so he gives a lot of uh, characteristics here. Um, but the, what we're seeing here is how this is an early science, the, that even Imam al-Shafi'i in, in so long ago, he was talking about this as well. But the content of this uh, slide, we're going to talk about it elsewhere. Uh, so who is a mujtahid? Okay. A mujtahid or a person who does the action of ijtihad, who exerts a great deal of effort in trying to find out the correct ruling on a subject, he has to have certain characteristics. Okay, and there is no uh, there is no general agreement on this. Okay, uh, we say there's general agreement, but there's no specific agreement. You know, so some scholars they might have ten characteristics, some might have twelve, some might have nine, but in general, they are all in agreement on. Uh, on the core um, characteristics or the core prerequisites that the person has to have. First of all, this person, he must have knowledge of the Arabic language. The person must know the Arabic language. Now, why, why do you think that is? Why is the Arabic language um, a requirement? And this is, some, this is one of the core things that none of the uh, scholars disagree upon. Because the Quran is in the Arabic? The Quran and the Hadith are in the Arabic language, and so it, it is. It is very difficult. So you can understand Islam very well if you don't understand Arabic. Okay, Alhamdulillah, there are enough translated resources that you can understand Islam very well. But to be able to extract extract the rulings, okay, to extract the benefit from the from the religion, you have to you have to have the the, the source. 
Okay, you have to be able to take directly from the source. If you're only taking it from a translation, you're not able to extract everything. And so there is a limitation upon the person. And that's something that's important. So the Arabic language, and not any Arabic language on top of that. We're not talking uh, brief about uh, a person who, who knows how to speak uh, Arabic language in the street. We're talking about a person who has academic and, and deep, good understanding of the Arabic language, uh, the, the grammatical rules and the eloquence and so forth, because they're able to understand from it, the Qur'an, what the average person is not able to understand. They're able to extract those rulings and those those benefits. Okay, uh, The person has to have a deep knowledge of the Qur'an and Sunnah. So among the things that you have to know from the Qur'an and Sunnah are the things that we were talking about earlier. So a person has to have knowledge of Asbab and Nuzul. He has to know why, uh, what were the reasons for the revelation of the Qur'an. Okay, So when, when we're going to talk about a particular ayah, why was this ayah revealed? Under what conditions? Under what circumstances? What is the is, is this uh, an ayah which is subject to abrogation or not? And so forth. They have to be very knowledgeable about the sciences of the Qur'an, okay, uh, and how they uh, apply. The person has to be knowledgeable about the tafsir of the Qur'an. They have to be knowledge of, knowledgeable about the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, okay. They all have to know which hadith is authentic and which is not authentic. And if there is a difference of opinion regarding the authenticity of a hadith, that person should have the knowledge to understand the difference between them. Why one person uh, classified it as Hassan and another one classified it as Daif, for example. They have to have the, so all these things that we've been studying for the last, uh, you know, six weeks, these are all relevant things that a person has to become very solid in. He has to become, a, have a strong foundation in these, uh, in these sciences to be able to understand is this valid or is not valid? Can it be used or it cannot be used? The person has to have knowledge of usul al-fiqh. They have to be very knowledgeable about the opinions and the statements of the sahaba, of the tabi'een, of the great imams, of the great scholars throughout history. And the differences as well. So what, where's the ijma and where's the ikhtilaf? Where is their consensus of the scholars? And ikhtilaf, where do they differ? between each other and what is the the basis for their their differences the mujtahid has to know maqasid al-sharia we haven't talked about maqasid al-sharia so i'll spend a little bit of time to explain it now maqasid al-sharia it means the objectives of the sharia what did the uh, sharia come with and so i i put it in arabic below just as a summary innama innaha uh, مبنية على تحقيق المصالح ودراء المفاسد. Right? It is built upon مقاصد الشريعة is built upon the establishment of good and that which is beneficial and the prevention of the of harm, the prevention of corruption, the prevention of the the spread of of uh, of harm. وأن المصالح والمفاسد على مراتب and that those things that are beneficial and those things that are harmful are going to be in degrees because it's not a black and white science it's going to be a lot of gray and so some things they're not 100% beneficial they're only 75% beneficial and some things are not 100% harmful they're only 50% harmful. And so we have to understand then where the Sharia is on these on these general topics, okay, that are the objectives. But generally speaking, the Sharia came to establish that which is beneficial for mankind and to prevent that which is harmful or uh, damaging to mankind. That is the, the general understanding. Why is this important? Because then it helps you to be able to look into rulings. So, for example, a man comes to you and says, I'm sick and tired of my wife. I can't tolerate her anymore. And I want a divorce. What's happened? Why, why are you saying this now? 
Well, I'm saying this because, you know, all of my friends, their wives, they cook very good food. And they're always telling me, mashallah, when we go to visit them, mashallah, we eat very well. My wife, she cannot cook. She burns even toast. And I'm tired of it. So what is the, the objective of the sharia in this case? If we're going to look at it black and white, okay, does the man have the right to divorce his wife because he's upset with her cooking? Black and white. No. No? Why not? There's so many alternatives where she can't cook, you can cook yourself. Ah, you're right, you're right, but you're, I'm asking you black and white. I'm asking you, is it haram for him to divorce her? That, because we're talking about sharia, we're not talking about, you know, benefits. We're talking about the just black and white. If he comes and he says, I want to divorce her, uh, yes, you can advise him and all that, but he's, he's insistent, okay? Is it haram? No, it's not haram. That's good. That's, a, that's what I'm trying to say, is some people, they only look, they only look from this uh, perspective, halal and haram. They don't look from the perspective of what does the Sharia want. Do you understand the difference what I'm talking about, guys? Here, this is very, very important. It's not simply to look at everything as halal and haram, and, and that's all. Because there are things that yes, they are halal. Okay, so it's okay. It's acceptable for him to to do this, but it's not the right thing. It's halal for him to divorce her, but that's not the right thing. And if the person doesn't have this understanding of maqasid al-sharia, he will not necessarily be able to uh, be very effective. So what is the sharia, uh, what's the, the objective of the sharia when it comes to the relationship between people, between believers? What is the objective? To reconcile, excellent, very good, Yusuf. So reconciliation is the is the idea. Reconcile between people. Is this found in the Quran? Yes. For example, Allah's statement in Surah Al Nisa and reconciliation is good. To reconcile between people is good. So the the Sharia came to join people together, to bring people together, not to divide people. So if the person doesn't have this concept in mind doesn't have a knowledge of these overriding themes in Islam, they can make a lot of mistakes, even though they are not necessarily wrong, okay, when we're looking at it from a technical standpoint, they're not wrong, but absolutely it's wrong from the general standpoint. Does that make sense to you guys? Everybody understand what I'm saying? Yes. Iram, Maryam? So this is the idea of maslaha, okay, as well. Knowing one's own society and the public interest is another issue altogether, okay? You have to know your own society and the public interest, okay? I'll, uh, here's another question, okay? The niqab, is the niqab something which is, um, uh, okay, let's look at it this way. A woman is has a very beautiful face. A woman a particular woman that we're talking about, she has a very beautiful face. Uh, and people, they often look at her. Okay. For her to wear the niqab is uh, with the, she's wearing it with the intention of uh, not creating fitna and, uh, you know, and uh, protecting herself as well, the people looking at her and so forth. Is this something good? Is this something recommended for her? Islamically, as a as a, we're just talking generally speaking, not in a specific circumstance. Generally speaking, is this something recommended for her? Yes. Okay. Yes. Good. It is one hundred percent. There's no, there is no, no doubt. Okay, that this would be something that would be recommended. It's not. We're not talking far uh, here. Okay, we're talking about recommendation. Is it mustahab? Yes, it's mustahab. There is no difference of opinion on this matter among the scholars of Ahl Sunnah, uh, to my to my knowledge. 
this is uh, clear. There is some difference of opinion. Some people might say it is fard, and others might say it's mustahab, but the concept of the fact that it's mustahab is agreed upon. Everybody knows that something good, okay? How uh, necessary is it? There is difference of opinion there, but everybody is, uh, is on the same page that this is something good. Now, um, same woman, she lives in a non-Muslim society. The same woman, she lives in a non-Muslim society. Okay, she lives, uh, for example, in a society like in the United States, which is uh, somewhat um, uh, very prejudiced against Muslims, and uh, and sometimes to the point that they might harm people. Okay, they might attack people. So the the image of the niqab in in America, okay, is associated with only one thing, and that is what. Terrorists. Terrorists. Okay, this is exactly what the terrorists look like when they see women wearing a club. This is a terrorist. Okay, so in the case now that she lives in the United States, okay, does the niqab now is it still mustahab in the case of her living in the United States, or now it might actually go to the, it might lean towards more the makro. Okay, it might be more harmful for her, and it might be more harmful for her family more harmful for her society, or the Muslim group, or things like that. There, this is the discussion that we're going to talk about, because you have to know your own society. We're not talking about, so if she lives in Medina, mashallah, go for it, okay? She lives in Malaysia, alhamdulillah. She lives in Egypt, alhamdulillah. She lives in, you know, uh, Gulf country, or Arab country, or Syria, or Iraq, or Pakistan. Uh, Perfect, okay? There's no doubt that it's mustahab in those societies. It's acceptable. A woman wearing niqab in Saudi Arabia is not seen as a terrorist. It's seen as a normal person. Okay? A woman wearing niqab in Egypt, it's normal. A woman wearing niqab in Iraq, it's normal. A woman wearing niqab in Malaysia, it's something common. Someone in, in, uh, uh, in Pakistan, very common. There's no problem about that. But when you're in a society which is already very kind of on edge and very scared, okay, is that niqab that she's having a good intention for wearing, is it going to bring about more harm for her? So in this case, because we're not talking about it being a fault, because this is, we're talking about an issue of is it mustahab or not, knowing the society is important, right? And so again, that's something very, very important that all of this knowledge and information has to go into the person who is making ijtihad and as we'll see the person who is making iftat later you have to look at the public interests so there is a lot more than just the 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 black and white that, that's involved here furthermore the mujtahid has to have intelligence and confidence so they have to be intelligent person. This is not something that's memorized knowledge. This is something that's based on understanding, based on uh, you know wisdom and and the ability to manipulate this information in your mind. The person has to be confident, okay? Because if he's not confident, nobody will listen to this person. If he's uh, you know kind of unsure of himself, um, the person has to have righteousness, has to have good manners has to have a good reputation in the society as well, okay? All of these things, they go into the mujtahid scholar, okay? So the areas of ijtihad, okay? Um, specifically, ijtihad is not time and space restricted. It is not time and space restricted, all right? Can, so breaking the ijtihad or, you know, going against the ijtihad, is ijtihad uh, binding? That's the question. Is one scholar's ijtihad binding upon the Muslims? Like upon all Muslims or like the ones in his area? Either. Because even the ones in his area. Is it binding? I don't think it's binding. No, it's not binding. Remember, the only things that are binding upon us are the four things we discussed before, which are what? Quran, Sunnah, and? 
Ijma, okay? So the, the, if there's consensus of the scholars on an issue. So if multiple scholars make ijtihad and all of them they agree, then we call this ijma. They call this consensus. At that point in time, you cannot go against it. You, you cannot violate it at that point. But an individual scholar's ijtihad, yes, uh, he might be wrong. He might be right. As we already said, the hadith of the Prophet you know, it's, that he, you know, ijtihada, okay? al hakam hakama that he he's made a ruling and he tried his best to come to the ruling, okay, but he might be wrong. Okay, he may have come to the wrong conclusion. Okay, it's jihad in itself is what? So going back here, is it definitive or is it speculative? It is always speculative, okay? It's jihad is always dhanni, okay, dhanni. It is it, it is speculative. There there isn't a, a clear issue. Uh, something that becomes clear when it becomes to the point of, of clarity. Then, as I said, to reach the point of ijma. Remember, ijtihad is something that we're looking at where the Quran and the Sunnah did not speak about something. It's not something that's been spoken about clearly, and as a result, we're having to try to uh, figure out figure it out. Okay, with the mind. So as a result, you can answer the last question. Is every mujtahid correct? That's an easy question. What do you guys think? Mariam, what do you think? Is every mujtahid correct? Iram, what do you think? I think maybe in his time and space at that point, maybe he's correct, but might not be for everybody he's correct. So the, the answer is no, okay? that the, there's Not every mushad is correct. So some of them will be correct, some of them will be wrong. Remember, this is dhani, this is speculative, okay? And so some of them will reach the right conclusion, the others will not, all right? And so it, and and we may not know that we we it is not always clear which one is right and which one is wrong. If it was clear, it would then the Mushad himself was smarter than us. He would know. He would have come to the right conclusion. So sometimes only later we find out the Mushad was wrong. Okay, because more information becomes uh, available and so forth. Are you guys with me, Iram, Mariam? Is it making sense or am I losing you? Unable to answer, maybe. All right. So, um, I'm not going to go over that example right now. Okay, alhamdulillah. So, what is the ruling on ishtihad? Okay. So, the ruling on ishtihad is it is a duty of the scholars. Okay. In principle, it is a collective obligation. In principle, it is a collective obligation, not an individual obligation. Okay. But generally speaking, it is the duty of the scholars. Scholars who have knowledge, they have to share that knowledge. Okay, It can become an individual obligation in some cases. Number one, if there's only one person qualified to do it, and that person is asked. Okay, So this, this somewhat happens in, in minorities, uh, communities, in places where Muslims are a minority. So sometimes uh, the... Maybe a person, he's not uh, qualified in his own society, in maybe a Muslim country, to be a mujtahid, but he is qualified in, in when he's in the minority because he's the best person in that small group, okay? And so he might have to, uh, he might have to do so if, if, uh, if there is a, a need for it, okay? Secondly, um, if the person has the qualification, of course, okay, he should be involved in it. So we're looking at it a different way. Uh, if the issue is urgent, okay, there is a person asking you a question right now, okay, and needs an answer right now. If she had this compulsory at that point in time on every competent scholar, he cannot divert or he cannot defer to someone else. It becomes fard al ayn or wajib al ayn, okay, in that case. It becomes an individual obligation, all right? But if the question is not urgent, okay, it becomes a collective obligation. Okay, fard al kifaya or wajib al kifaya. So, what's an example would be, for example, like a lot of Muslims in the West, okay, they ask questions about 
can I get a bank loan? Okay, can I get a bank loan so I can buy a house? All right. So this is one of the questions of Ijtihad. So the scholars, they look at the situation and they say, okay, you know, why do you need to buy a house? And he says, I need to buy a house because I have a family and the only places I can rent a house are in very dangerous places. I cannot rent a house in a, in, there is no houses for rent in the safe places in the town or in the city. And so I have no choice but to buy the house. Okay. So that I can, uh, so I will not expose my family to danger. All right. This is one of the actual reasons which is provided. All right. So then the scholar has to make ijtihad. Is this a valid, uh, is it a valid um, darura, the necessity? Okay. Are there Islamic alternatives available? And so forth. And so this is the, because, so is this an urgent question or non urgent? Urgent because the family safety. It's uh, so it is. It's not. So you might say that okay, he's looking, but he doesn't need to have the answer today. Oh, he's trying to get the answer. So if you give the answer to him in two weeks, it's not going to change much, right? Uh, because this process in of itself, even getting a mortgage, it takes time. So this is something that he can say. I I don't have the ability to answer this question. Okay. So I'm going to refer it to the mufti of the region and see what he has to say okay he will get back to me in a few days or in one week or in 10 days or something like that it's fine but what if the person comes and says uh sheikh i have my my uh family member is uh uh is sick okay and the the doctor said that he's going to give him a medicine uh, that uh, is life saving, but this medication is coming from, you know, uh, pigs, or it has pig DNA, or it is, uh, it has some haram element or something like that. This is an urgent issue because if the sheikh cannot say, "Well, I'll get back to you tomorrow," the thing, the person is dying right now. I need, to, I need an answer now. You see the difference. So in that case, it becomes a, compuls a compulsion upon the competent scholar. If a person, even if he doesn't have all of the, the characteristics of a mujtahid, but he has to do the very best that he can to help the situation if it's urgent like that. Someone is dying, some situation, uh, there, is, uh, uh, there is going to be some harm if the, if the question is not answered at that point in time. It is, of course, prohibited on the one who is not qualified, okay? And so, and that is where the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. There is a number of hadith on this issue. And Ibn Abbas قال قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم من قال في القرآن بغير علم فليتبوأ مقعده من النار. Okay. والحديث الآخر من قال في القرآن برأيه فأصاب فقد أخطأ. So we have the first hadith, which is the Hassan hadith. The Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم say, whoever speaks on the Quran without knowledge. Let him take his seat in the hellfire. Let him take his seat in the hellfire. So this is very, very important that we do not. Uh, so generally, of course, when the person is giving uh, a ruling on something, then they're giving, uh, they're speaking about the Quran and the Hadith, right, without knowledge. And so this is a serious issue. And uh, and the next Hadith is weak on its own, weak in terms of its isnad. Uh, but the 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 metin, the text of the hadith is a valid text. Whoever speaks about the Quran according to his own opinion and is correct, still has committed a mistake because he should not speak of his own opinion. He should only speak, qala Allah, qala Rasulullah, that he's taking that knowledge. And so this is what we call a naql, not al aql. Okay, so we we'll talk about tafsir. Tafsir is a naql type of knowledge. It's a transmitted type of knowledge, okay? It is not aql, a rational type of knowledge or something that we, what you think or what your opinion. We don't, our opinion and our thoughts do not enter into the understanding of the Quran, okay? Mm -hmm. The understanding of the Quran comes only from the transmit, what has been transmitted to us from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam.
So some scholars are of the opinion that the full mujtahid, okay, the one that has all of those features. So going back to, you know, this, okay, the this encyclopedia of knowledge, okay, the, these types of people they don't exist anymore, okay. There's just too much information, and it's it's not possible for one person really to to have it, especially in in the modern day society. Subhanallah, it is very very difficult to have these types. Of, some people say that, whereas I think we can say that it is it is valid, you know, to say that there there have been scholars in the in the modern era, certainly within the last one hundred years, that they um they were of the level of Fulm al-Shahid. I think that there's uh, it it is uh, it is clear in that we we had people like that uh, in the last one hundred years, mashallah, that we benefited from, and they they uh, they uh, uh, mashallah bless them with a great deal of knowledge and a great deal of of uh, benefit to the ummah. So restricted as she had, without a doubt, though, is still possible, and it's happening all the time. Okay, so so if she had, of course, it's you know. It's very adaptable, okay, and it gives us the capacity to tackle new issues and problems, okay. And the justification of ishtihad, okay, is always going to be again going back to the Quran and Sunnah. So there are now levels of mujtahids, okay, so that you will see in this science or in this topic that there is a hierarchy of uh, mujtahids. So it's not a black and white in terms of you are or you aren't. But it is where are you in the in the uh, in the hierarchy? So we talk about the full mujtahid at the top, and that's the person that has all those characteristics, mashallah. And really, this type of person can do istanbat, which we're going to talk about in a moment. That they're able, really, they're able to go to the sources and extract from the sources uh, themselves. Then we have mujtahids that are only within their own school of thought. And then we have mujtahids of something called takhrij and mujtahids of tarjih. And then we have the final category, which is with the majority of the Muslims, which are muqallid. Muqallid, it means follower. Muqallid, it means follower. And so it has been sometimes uh, stated or the, the terminology has been used as blind follower. And I think that that blind follower is, a, is, a, is an unfortunate uh, use of this word because again the vast majority of muslims are in this category and they will always be in this category the vast majority of muslim mean they don't have the ability to you know sit and study you know fiqh and to uh and to gain this type of knowledge that they can evaluate you know um evaluate the 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 rulings um and so on this topic, okay, let me ask you this. You are reading a hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and it is an authentic hadith. And it appears to go against the madhab that you're following. Should you abandon that uh, ruling in your madhab and follow the hadith? It sounds really straightforward, right? Sounds straightforward, but like the imams would have done more research than I have. Exactly. So that's the idea here: <clears throat> is that in it, it, it's a somewhat arrogant for us sometimes to to say, well, you know, the the imam, you know, made this mistake, and so I'm going to follow the the prophet I send them, or I think I'm going to be following the prophet I send them by following this hadith, because we don't understand what they understood okay so it doesn't mean that we you know that we should just ignore it but it, a person should say it should say okay what did the ulama say about this hadith okay how did they understand it and why is it not part of that method okay so you might find at the end of the day that you you say oh for some reason they never discussed it and so uh, you know there I don't see any reason to uh, abandon this hadith and so I, I'm going to follow it okay but we shouldn't be so arrogant to think that all these ulama that passed okay that stayed within their madhab that they're all wrong and they're all ignorant and they don't have any idea about this hadith and only you 
You're the one who discovered this hadith. That's the idea. And this is somewhat happening a lot today. It's happening a lot today because the knowledge became kind of um, accessible. Okay. And so it used to be only found in books and, you know, people never like to open books. But now because it's on the internet and you might find a scholar mentioning it on YouTube or TikTok or something. And now all of a sudden, some of that knowledge be kind of became a more accessible. So people are using it, but they don't understand. So they feel like, oh, I've got the whole information, but they only have a puzzle piece. Okay. So it is from the the humility of the believer again in in this subject okay to recognize okay these scholars they had knowledge these scholars they read through the entire quran hundreds of times more than we did they knew the hadith of the prophet better than us why didn't they you know follow this or what was their understanding of this and that's very very important okay and again this is part of the humility that has to come with this topic the mujtahid has to be a humble person because this is the Prophet Sallallahu And this was the behavior of the Sahaba and the behavior of all the great Imams that have always existed, the scholars of, of this Ummah, from the Sahaba and going down. All of them have had humility. So it's important not to discount the fact that all of these ulama, they don't have this information. Okay, yes, so a little knowledge can be very, very dangerous, okay? And so that's, uh, so I, I, I warn you about that because we see that a lot today. There's uh, some people that they only know two or three things and they think they know everything as a result of that. And that's, uh, it's the, there's, this is a an ocean of knowledge, subhanAllah. Once you start going in and you start seeing, oh, wow, that hadith that you thought was so clear, black and white, it's really not what you thought it was, okay? And it might have been one of the, as we talked about, uh, earlier, we talked about the Nasikh and Mansukh, right? And so is there a Nasikh and Mansukh in the, in the Hadith? Yes, there is. So you have to have all this information. You have to have all this knowledge to understand it. So the point I'm not saying to anybody, don't uh, study. I'm saying be aware of that. Be respectful of that. Try to understand instead of jumping to a conclusion and saying, "Oh, every scholar before me is wrong, and I'm the I'm the smart guy because I saw this one hadith, and I'm gonna you know uh, I'm going to start my own fiqh because of that." So when we look at it a different way. Okay, we have al mujtahideen fi shara. Okay, so these are the full mujtahids. Mujtahid fi shara. Mujtahid is in this case are in issues of sharia is the one who fulfilled in entirety all of the previously mentioned conditions and is attested to by the people of knowledge of their time. Okay, such an individual is not permitted to follow a method. Such a person is not permitted to follow a method because they are people who are able to get the, the information directly from the sources, and so they, they really shouldn't be um, followers. In fact, these are people who, when you see their names, these are people who essentially had their own madahib that became absorbed into madahib that came later. So Ibrahim al nakhai for example, Sufyan al thawri uh, Al-Awza'i, Al-Layth ibn Sa'ad, Ibn Rawaha, so as an example, Sufyan al-Thawri and Layth ibn Sa'ad, both of them, they had madahib that were later absorbed into the uh, madahib that came after. Then you have the mujtahid in the madhab, mujtahidun fil madahib, okay? Oh, fil madhab. So we have a scholar who is qualified to differ with the opinions put forward within their madhab of study. So Ibn Abd al -Bakh, for example, he differs from other Malikis. He is a Maliki scholar, but he differs from other Malikis. Imam al Nawawi, for example, he differs with other Shafi's, but he is a Shafi. Ibn Abdin for the Hanafis, Ibn Qudama for the Hanbal, and so forth. These scholars are followers of the Asul of their Madhab, but they have used their knowledge, understanding, and judgment in deriving new verdicts within the Madhab. So you'll find that these, these uh, particular scholars, that they have some opinions that are differing from their own madhab. Uh, then you have al-mujtahidun fil masail. So you have a person who is a mujtahid in a particular issue. Okay, so they remain within their madhab, but they are able to make ijtihad on certain aspects within the madhab 
that they are no knowledgeable of. Okay. So what's the difference between two and three? Both of them are dealing with people who are making ijtihad within the madhab. What's the difference between two and three? Three is a bit more specific. Yes. So three is a person who is able to speak on one topic, but not the others. Okay. So he's a in everything except one topic, but he's an expert in one topic, a specialist in one topic. Okay. Two is the person who is who is the generalist, mashallah, who knows, who has a deep knowledge, mashallah. And so they're able to differ with their method on multiple issues, not on one specific topic. So we look at ishtihad a different way. We can look at it as having two types. We can say that there is Islam Baat and there is Tarjih. Islam Baat is going to be this first category. The Mujtahid Fishal. This is the person who is able to extract the ruling directly from Quran and Sunnah. All right. And these types of people are rare. Okay. Um, but they are able to look into the issues, okay, that maybe have never been researched before. Uh, or it could be something that was discussed by the past scholars, but he does not uh, consult them at all when arriving at a conclusion, which is what we were talking about just a moment ago. So the reality of is is there a scholar today that we can say is doing Islam Baat? Not really, because that would mean that we're saying that there is a scholar today who's looking at issues, okay, and nobody before him looked at those issues. Do you understand? So what we're saying here is is that oh there's a scholar today in so and so country and he has he is looking into the issue of prayer into the issue of the prayer okay and he is able to extract rulings regarding the prayer directly from the Quran and Sunnah that were never discussed before that no other imam mentioned it before or talked about it before or his opinions are differing from all of the other schools of thought and madahib. Is this possible? No. It's not. It's not even it's not even a person who would think that is a person who 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 basically is destroying Islam. To think that I mean, is, a, is to destroy Islam altogether. Because if you think that all these people that came before, the 1,500 years of, of scholars that came before, that they missed something about the Salah that you figure out, then you're basically telling us, oh, there's a, there could be a lot of things that were missed. And so you, you're, you're actually you know, fracturing the foundation of Islam by saying something like this. And so for sure, this is not the case. This is not the situation. This is not going to happen. Are there people who try to do that? Yes. There are people who do not consult the madhab, okay? Meaning they don't look at the work that was done by Imam Shafi'i, Imam Malik, Imam Abu Hanifa, Imam Ahmad. So they don't look at what they did. They don't look at their work. And they try to look at the material themselves. And they come up with conclusions that are differing from these four great scholars and this is like i said unprofessional this is unprofessional and wrong uh, generally they, they don't come to the right conclusions so you will find that these things were already expounded upon by the previous ulama now which one do you find to be the most you know correct that's a different story okay 
that is something that we can have a discussion about. We can discuss that, okay, now with the all of the knowledge that is is available now, that was not necessarily available to all the previous on um, looking at it, which, which opinion uh, is more agreeable with the Quran and Sunnah. But the opinions are there. They're already there. There's no no need for anyone to to uh, extract this opinion or to kind of bring it to the surface. We already have them. We just again, there are some differences of opinion. When we talk about difference of opinion between the madahab, um, what are we talking about here? How much how much do you guys think um, do they differ in a majority or a minority of uh, or, or I'll give you a third choice? They differ in the majority of issues. They differ in the minority of issues, or they differ in an extreme minority of issues. Minority of issues, like it mostly the argument is like where you put the hand and things like that. Yes, and so I would say even an extreme minority of issues. Okay, it's very limited because again, when you go to Mecca, okay, you are you are uh, around the people that have different meta, a different method than you. Okay. Do you really, are you guys doing different things? No. You're not seeing that, oh, this person praying next to me is praying, I don't even know what he's doing. I don't even know if he's a Muslim. You don't ever see something like that. You see somebody who might be doing slightly different than you. Maybe as you said, they hear their hand position or something like that, or they put their hands in the salah, or they put their hands on their knees when they're making a ruku or sujood or something, or, you know, in the sujood, that type of thing. It's minor, minor things like that. It's not something major. So alhamdulillah, Islam is preserved in alhamdulillah. So the vast, the vast majority of the fiqh is the same. So the fiqh on, uh, on uh, and that's why you look at where did the imams agree and where do they disagree? They agreed on the vast majority of things. All four imams, they agreed on the vast majority of things. There's a very limited amount of disagreement. And so that's something important, you know, because we see that, it's, that this disagreement is a mercy from Allah of looking at things two different ways. Both of them can be right. As we look at the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu when he told a group of the companions, don't pray Asr until you reach uh, this destination. And so the Maghrib was approaching uh, and they didn't reach the destination. So some of them, they said, the Prophet Sallallahu said, don't pray Asr until you get there. So uh, even if we get there after Maghrib, we're not going to pray Asr until we get there because the Prophet Sallallahu said that. The other group, they said, no, the Prophet's intention was, like, what's his maqsad, his, uh, what, he, in, what he wanted to tell us, okay, what he was trying to say is, go fast, okay? Go fast and don't stop, all right? But, you know, we, we, Allah, as we said, he commanded us to pray also before the sunset, and so we have to pray. So one group, they waited until they arrived, and another group, they prayed before they arrived, okay? They stopped only to pray. So when they came back to the Prophet Sallallahu and they said, this is what we did, which one of us is right? Who is right? Both, because the Prophet didn't rebuke any of them. Exactly. Both were right. And he said that. Both of you are right. Both of you. You both had valid reason for approaching, for, for what you did. Okay? You both had an Islamically valid reason for what you did. Okay, even though they did two two different things, they disagreed. But this disagreement is still, alhamdulillah, within the realm of what is acceptable. And so, so the person who does something different than you, fiqh wise, it doesn't mean that they're unacceptable. Mean doesn't mean that they're off of the path. It doesn't. It, it, again, the the ulama, all of them, all of these these righteous men. They were all having the sincerity, and they all had the uh, objective of trying to find the right answer. So again, this is part part of the uh, of the of the earlier scholars is to not to you know kind of uh, uh, dismiss them or dismiss their opinions so lightly, like what a lot of people do to some people do today, which is really arrogant. So that's Istanbul, okay, which, as we said, is not really going to be, you're not going to be seeing a lot of that. You're really unlikely to see it at all. 
Okay, and then you have tarjih, which is looking into the opinions of the scholars and the evidences they use, and then preferring one over the other. This, on the other hand, is very common. So tarjih is very common. So we have, so we go back to um, this here, tahrij and tarjih, okay? So we are looking at this mujtahid of tahrij. What is tahrij, okay? So tahrij is a, a, a variety of types. We have tahriya, ta'sin, and then tahrij tamayus, okay? So the first group, or the first type of tahrij, we can say, is tahrij al furua And so, or it is tahriya to extract rulings from the fatwas of the imams or other past scholars, okay? And this is done when a later scholar agrees with an overarching ruling of a past scholar, okay? So I'm going to the fatwa of that imam, or, you know, and, and the evidences they use, and I'm extracting something from it, which is is in already in agreement with what they said okay mm -hmm. so they might have given an overarching ruling and i'm getting a specific or something more particular okay i'm extracting from that general ruling all right ta'seel is creating new principles and rules based on the pre-existing material of that school okay this is the second type of takhrij or takhrij al usul Okay. So creating new principles and rules based on the pre-existing material of that school. Okay. So these newly derived principles help create further rules for future generations of that school, of that method. Okay. Now, when it comes to uh, the last group or Tahrij Tamayus, okay, so it depend this is kind of a, a spectrum. All right, that um, diff the definitions are a little bit, you know, uh, are somewhat the same. Uh, so working within the school of thought to ascertain, working within the madhab to ascertain what the imam actually said, when there is a conflict on narration from him, preferring one ruling's attribution to the imam over another. So you will see this, for example, that you'll see that, especially with Imam Ahmad, the Imam Ahmad, sometimes he has two uh, opinions on a topic, all right, and they're completely contradictory to each other. <laughs> so, how is that possible? How can you have one opinion and the other one is comp almost the contradiction of the, of the first? So, that's the idea here of Tamayus, okay? I need to go through, I need to dis discern which one is really the, his opinion. Okay, or did he have one opinion in a particular case and the other opinion in, an, in another circumstance? Okay, so which one is the general, which one is the specific? These types of things, okay, which one is stronger narration, which one, you know, all of these types of uh, is, is now you're going to be making tamayus, which is, you know, kind of, um, you know, uh, selecting these things out and, and organizing them, okay. So you see here, there's a lot of depth in this, mashallah. There's, uh, I hope that you're getting an appreciation for the extraordinary depth of this material and how, yeah, again, how uh, unprofessional it is for, for someone just to kind of dismiss all of this work that was done. The last topic we're in, 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 uh, before ending is the ifta and mufti. So ifta is the, the science of giving fatwa. Okay, and the mufti is the person who gives the fatwa. What is the fatwa? Fatwa, it is the legal ruling. It means legal ruling. Okay, this is an, a legal ruling which is being issued by a mufti on a topic. Okay, so if that or the giving of a fatwa, okay, rever refers to providing formal sharia opinion, which is a fatwa, a formal sharia opinion on a specific issue, either on request or for the mere sake of enlightening people on the Sharia ruling regarding an arising subject, okay? So this is, so as we talked about, you know, mortgages on homes in the West, okay? This is one of those issues where there is fatwas. There's a lot of fatwas on this issue. Um, so some of the people were asked, some of the scholars were asked, and they provided the fatwa, and others, 
they said no, there's a lot of confusion about this issue, and so I'm going to provide a fatwa to clarify it to the people. Um, secondly, the mufti is a person who is well versed in the sharia, has sufficient knowledge about the issues and events on which the fatwa are sought, and has adequate ability to derive sharia rulings from their original sources and apply them to issues or events in question. Okay, so this is giving the, that's your definitions. So in the ruling, just like Ijtihad, okay, fatwa is not legally binding. Okay, so um, in, in principle, okay, so especially like in non-Muslim countries, it, there's no legal legally binding case at all because there's no Sharia in in the uh, in in uh, countries that are not Muslim. Uh, but even in Muslim countries, the fatwa may not necessarily be legally binding until that fatwa is adopted by a majority and then may be codified into the law of that country. But what about the person who is receiving the fatwa? It is religiously binding once the proof is established for its validity. So that means that if you go to ask a, 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 a mufti about something, let's say I go and I say, uh, Sheikh, I want to buy this uh, house um, because I think that, um, you know, uh, there is no no other way for me to have a safe home for my family without buying, okay? And the sheikh says, "How big is your family?" You say, "Well, we only uh, we we are uh, uh, my wife and I and one child." So he says, "Why you need a house? Why don't you live in an apartment?" There's very safe apartments in this town because the person who's giving fatwa he has to have knowledge of the of the vicinity or not yes he has to remember he has to have local knowledge he can't just be you cannot go to i, I cannot go to uh, uh indonesia and, and ask a sheikh in indonesia tell him you know a, a question about something dealing with li life in the united states it's it's this is not uh, sincere okay it's not sincere. The, the sheikh has to have knowledge of the circumstances. Okay, so that sheikh who's living in the Western country or in that city, he might say, "I don't know what you're talking about. I know a lot of people who are renting and they're they're safe. They never had, alhamdulillah, any crime. They never had anybody attacking them. So no, what you're asking is not a necessity. This is not the rura. You don't have the right to go and commit haram." Uh, to get into an interest-bearing mortgage, okay? So that is a religiously binding, you know, uh, statement, okay? Because he has provided the Islamic evidence for it. So is it fair now for that person to go and ask somebody else? No, I don't think you're allowed fatwa shopping. <laughs> this is shopping, exactly, fatwa shopping, okay? That you want something and you're going to keep asking until you get the answer that you want, from somebody and this is what we call fatwa shopping and it's very very common okay and so uh to be very to be very careful with this issue okay especially if somebody's telling you somebody's telling you oh i heard that this is okay i don't know why you're being so strict but uh, you know so many scholars they said it's okay and yeah maybe they maybe so many scholars they did say it's okay but again what kind of scholars and what kind of level of knowledge and so because there's a Here's another question. Are there people, okay, in especially in the Muslim minority countries, are there people in the Muslim minority countries who are giving fatwa, though they do not have the uh, um, they don't have the the conditions of the mufti or they don't have the conditions of the person who can make ijtihad? Yes. Yeah, very much, unfortunately. Okay, so every small sheikh who came from a village from his own country and now he's living in the United States and he's leading a, a masjid, he's acting like he's a mufti. He's acting like he has all of these, these you know, we went all the way back here. He's acting like he has all, um, all of this. And when we said this is not common, this is not something common, okay? 
to find all of these things. And so you will not find it easily. So there's there are selected people, you know, uh, that will have all of these characteristics and not, not what people are acting like today. And so, but again, this is why we have to know this because we want to, we're learning so that we can be closer to Allah and we can be more careful with our religion. That where, where do we take our religion from? We don't take it from anybody. All right, so the conditions of iftat, that the person has to have knowledge of the ruling, so knowledge of the Islamic ruling, okay? The problem must have occurred, okay? So you see this happen a lot, like, you know, I'll give you an example. There's one one guy, he was uh, saying, he was he was calling one of the uh, shayukh on, um, uh, what's it called, on... Uh, one of these uh, TV channels, and he says, Sheikh, you know, uh, what would happen if I'm fasting and I slip in, uh, I'm walking in my house and I slip, uh, and when I slip, uh, a shawarma sandwich falls into my mouth. What do you think of this question? <laughs> I think it goes on longer than the shawarma. <laughs> Of course, is it, but is this uh, is this respectful? Is disrespectful? Very disrespectful. Okay, very disrespectful. That you know you're you're saying something and you're call you know taking the time of this uh, sheikh uh, who has you know serious questions to answer and you're asking him stupid questions or and, and did this happen? Okay, did this actually happen? Uh, did it happen? The the what you're talking? No, it didn't happen. It doesn't. This is somebody who is, you know, making things up, and he's uh, as we can see that he's trying to misuse the fatwa as the last category. So the problem has to have occurred. So many times I saw this when I was sitting with uh, some of my teachers uh, that they will be sitting, uh, and this is narrated a lot about Imam Shafi'i, that uh, people will come and ask him a question. And he will say, "Did this happen?" And they'll say, I don't know, I'm just asking you hypothetically. So he wouldn't answer. He would say, when it happens, come back and we'll discuss it. He's not going to talk about hypotheticals. So the problem has to have, a, they're actually, we're dealing with something real. We're dealing with, with a real issue. Then we're going to talk. We're not going to sit here and say, well, you know, if we travel to space, um, and so now there is no sun, uh you know how are we going to find uh how uh, so what direction do we make uh the salah you know which how do we take the qibla if we're in another galaxy Actually, when this happens then we'll deal with it okay but right now this is not happening we have other problems that are happening that you don't know the answer to that we need to solve and that's the, that's the reality so knowledge of the ruling is knowledge of the Islamic ruling as well as knowledge of the condition of the uh, you know the town or condition of the people. Secondly, the problem has to have occurred. It's not hypothetical. Number three, they have to be careful that their answer doesn't create more harm. The answer of to the fatwa doesn't, or the answer to the problem or the fatwa that they're providing doesn't create more harm. And sometimes they do. So sometimes someone says, Sheikh, what do I do? That's oh, somebody, you know, he's uh, insulting the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. What should we do? Oh, you should go and you should uh, attack him. Okay. And so this idiot, uh, one idiot to another, uh, he goes and he follows. Okay. And this causes huge amount of more damage. Okay. So something that maybe nobody would have heard about. Okay. For example, like these cartoons about the Prophet Sallallahu in France, in the French magazine. If the Muslims hadn't went and made all these protests and uh, want to burn down the burn down the magazine, would anybody know about it? No, nobody would know. But now everyone says, "Oh, what? what why are they so upset?" Let me go and read about it. Let me go and see what these Muslims. So, you instead of maybe a few thousand people seeing this cartoon, now you made it few million people because of that. And then lastly, you know, you don't give a fatwa if you are uh, have a very strong suspicion that the person who is asking you is going to misuse it. Zahir, you have a question. Uh, my question is actually like, it's not related to this. I wanted to ask for earlier. 
that when when the mufti gives a fatwa right like especially your one on the bank loans in this so does that mean like the person who takes that loan he's no longer sinful because the guy already gave him a fatwa yes yes and so uh, and this is why when we go now let's if we look at this issue from the uh you know, from the the Sahaba, for example. So when people used to come to the Sahaba, we're talking about people who learned directly from the Prophet and they saw the Prophet, they were interacting with the Prophet. People would come and ask them questions and they would say, oh, don't ask me, go ask this other person, he's better than me, and so forth. They would always defer, always defer. They didn't want to ask uh, answer questions. And it's been said by, I think, Al-Hassan al-Basri, he said, anybody who answers every question that comes to him is insane. Somebody who answers every question that's brought to him is insane. Why? Because uh, as the, there is a hadith of the Prophet ﷺ where he says, "Ajraakum lil fatwa, ajraakum lil nar." Okay, the one who the those of you who race to get fatwa, they're essentially racing to into to go into the hellfire. And so it's not something that should be you know so prominent and right now. I find it very unusual. Like again, knowing knowing the situation of the uh, of the Sahaba, okay, the fact that they didn't want to answer questions. What do you think about TV shows today, like these TV shows that they have on satellites? Ask the Imam or the websites, ask the Imam, okay? And you find that some guy on the uh, TV channel or something, he's sitting and answering questions live on the air. No opinions? I think the internet itself is just dangerous. We don't know the person. We don't know the scholar. Right? We don't have details about him. Not about him. I'm, asking, I'm saying the this man who agreed to do it. <laughs> what kind of person would agree to do this? Because this is something which is dangerous. If the Prophet is saying the ones of you who are racing to get fatwa are racing into the hellfire, why would why would anyone agree to do this? Why would anybody, you know, have this type of a program? So what I see in some of the countries, okay, like in Saudi, as an example, I saw this a couple of, that they have, so they invite sometimes a sheikh to come onto these programs, and he looks like he's he's sitting on nails. He looks like he's very very uncomfortable and like he wants to run out of the, the studio. <laughs> and this is the way it should be. He should not be comfortable. This is not something that oh, come and see me next week. We're going to have more questions. Or hey guys, come on, you guys aren't calling. You need to call. You need to use the phone more often. We want to hear your questions. This is crazy. Again, I'm not saying it. Someone much better than me said it, uh, Hassan al-Basri, where he said that the people who answer the questions, every question that's coming to them, they're crazy. They're insane. Because there's nobody, number one, nobody has all that knowledge, okay? Number And number two, that you are putting yourself at risk. Because as you ask the here, so the person who's, who, the person who comes and asks the that uh, imam, and that imam says, "Yeah, go for it. You can go ahead and, and get the 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 loan from the bank." Okay, if he's wrong, okay, and he doesn't have the qualifications, he doesn't have the qualification to give fatwa to begin with, and he go ahead, he he goes ahead, and he gives the fatwa. He's committing a sin, and he's leading other people to disobedience of Allah. And the Prophet Sallallahu he didn't entirely, 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 um, you know, uh, um, what's the word? He didn't um, excuse them entirely uh, from from this issue. Okay, uh, he he. Um, Um, for the Muslims who, who you know, they they go and they ask these fatwas and stuff like that, the Prophet Sallallahu didn't excuse them that, oh, anybody tells you anything, you know, you want, you know, you ha you can go ahead and follow it. Um, he, 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 there's a specific hadith, and you you look at, like, the hadith of Imam al like, what he gathered on this issue, okay? 
he gathered this uh, a very interesting hadith on this issue about you know knowing knowing what's sinful and what's not. So um, when he was asked, for example, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, um, he so we have um, you know uh, uh, this hadith, for example, where he said. Um, um, استفتي نفسك استفتي قلبك البر ما اطمئن ما اطمئنت إليه ما اطمئنت النفس إليه واطمئن إليه القلب والإثم ما حاك في النفس وتردد في الصدر وإن أفتاك الناس وأفتوك Okay, so this is a hadith in Sahih this is an authentic hadith in Al-Darimi in Sunan Al-Darimi where someone came to the Prophet and he said, tell me about what is sin. And so he said, uh, consult your soul, consult your heart. Righteousness is what reassures your soul and your heart. You feel comfortable doing it. And sin is what wavers in your soul and puts tension in your chest. Even if the people give you fatwa again and again that it's okay. So the Prophet Sallallahu here is telling us that if you get the fatwa and it, you don't feel comfortable, you don't feel at ease doing it. So these people, like I, someone came and told me recently, he said, oh, I went and I asked 20 shiuch about this issue of, of, uh, of mortgage before I did it. What do you think about that? Asking 20 shiuch about something, what does that indicate to you? Fatwa shopping. It is fatwa shah, that's one issue. What else it does it indicate to you? He was looking for a specific answer. He could definitely looking for a specific answer. But why not? Why didn't why didn't he just go with one or two? Why twenty? Consider the hadith I just told you. That Consider this hadith of the Prophet. What is the what do you think the relationship is? That he knew it was not right. Like exactly, he knows he knows it's not right, and so it's even though people are giving him fatwa, he doesn't feel comfortable with it. Okay, and so it, it's something that uh, so he wants to make himself feel comfortable to say, oh, I, twenty people they said it's okay. So well, if twenty people say it's okay, I, I guess I'm going to go with it, even though he knows it's not right. You know, what I'm saying he knows it's not right. So that's very very important. You know, to to look at this issue. And so this is very, again, this shows you why the, the sheikh who gives the fatwa, he has to have intelligence and wisdom. He has to recognize the person in front of him, what is his intention? His intention is to misuse this fatwa, or is this is a sincere person who is really trying to understand. And we have to always remember the fatwa of Imam Malik. What's the fatwa of Imam Malik? The very famous fatwa of Imam Malik. Remember, Imam Malik was, he was considered the most knowledgeable human being of his time. People would travel to, see, to, to ask him questions. They would travel for six months one way just to get to him to ask him questions. This is all authentically narrated about him. What's the very famous uh, fatwa of Imam Malik? All of you have to know it. This is this is this is required knowledge. You have to know it. Is it the one that he seeks the refuge from the actions and the soul? No, the the famous fatwa of Imam Malik is la adri, la adri. Okay, two words, la adri. I don't know. Okay, people would come to Imam Malik, okay, and at times he would answer, and at times he would say, I don't know. One person, he traveled from Morocco six months to ask him a question, and Imam Malik said, I don't know. And so that man said, what do you want me to tell my people when I go back? I came to you six months journey to get an answer to this question. What am I supposed to tell people when I go back? He said, tell them when you go back, Imam Malik said he doesn't know. 
And it takes a lot of humility to say لا أدري. It takes a lot of humility. What you hear a lot today from a lot of people is, well, I don't know, but I'm going to go ahead and stick my foot in my mouth anyways. Okay? I don't know, but I'm going to say something that might put me in the hellfire anyways. If you don't know, you don't know. There is no obligation upon you to say something that you don't know. If you don't know, you don't know. And that's something we have to learn from Imam Adik. This is a great lesson in humility from him and a great lesson in knowing your limits. But again, a lot of people, they don't know that today. A lot of people, a lot of these people who are leading Masajid, unfortunately, they don't understand this. They don't understand that you shouldn't, you have to be uh, wise. Why is this person asking me a question? Okay. Why is this person coming and, and, and talking to me? And I saw this a lot my own, myself, okay? So uh, people com calling, contacting me, and asking me questions, and they're just looking for the straight answer. And I say, I don't, uh, I don't understand what you're talking about. You have to give me a lot more detail. I need to understand everything about your condition so I, can, uh, I might be able to answer it for you. So, for example, one person contacted me, and he said, is it, um, is it a requirement for the woman to live uh, in the home of her husband, okay, uh, during her Aida period. Is it a requirement for the woman to live in her husband's home during the Aida? The answer to that is yes, it is a requirement. So he asked the question, is there any difference of opinion on this matter? Is there a difference of opinion on this matter? Yes. Almost always there's going to be a difference of opinion. So if you say yes, you'll almost, uh, in, in most cases, you'll be right, okay? But, and so there is difference, but there is, is difference of opinion for specific conditions only. Uh, generally, no, there is no difference of opinion, okay? If we say that, does any imam, uh, you know, say that a woman doesn't have to live, generally speaking? No, that's not the case. So we can say that there is ijma on this issue, okay? And there, why is there ijma? It's, there's not ijma actually. It's, it's because it's in the Quran and Sunnah, okay? So we don't need an ijma or qiyas or any of the, or ijtihad if it's in the Quran and Sunnah, right? It's already clear. But the ulama, they said there are exceptions. There are exceptions to the rule, and there are very few. So the exception to the rule would be that the woman, uh, you know, she if she is um, uh, if there is harm going to be uh, harm is going to come to her, then she cannot stay there. So this is generally when not when the husband is divorcing her, but when the uh, qadi is divorcing. So when the judge is divorcing the woman from her husband, usually it's because there's some harm. Usually he is beating her, he is hurting her. Is uh, abusing her, these types of things. So in that case, of course, she will not stay with him. She will complete her idda somewhere else. She has to complete the idda. She has to do it, but not in his house because there is harm to him. And the woman who divorces her husband, the khula, okay, she will not stay with her husband. She does, she she <laughs> she say, I don't. I, I'm divorcing him. I don't want to stay here. Okay. And the third one would be in the case of the woman and a man who did not consummate the marriage. So if a man and woman, they did not consummate the marriage, then it's haram for them to stay together in this case. So he divorces her, okay? And her idda is not the same as the idda of the woman that was consummated, okay? So these are that's it, those are, those are the conditions. Okay, so so I said, but I, but I didn't go into this detail with him. I said, why are you asking me this question? Well, I just want to understand. Uh, I said, why do you want to understand? Well, you know, uh, you know, because, uh, you know, there, uh, so after many questions, he finally got to the point. He said, yeah, I got married recently and I divorced my wife and uh, I just wanted, to, I don't want to, I want to make sure I'm not doing something wrong. I said, oh, really? MashaAllah, look at you, how righteous you are. You want to make sure you're not doing something wrong. When did you divorce your wife? Two, two and a half months ago. Now you're showing up and asking? 
only because so it wasn't because he's trying to take his religion seriously it's because his wife kept telling him you what you're doing is wrong what you're doing is wrong what you're doing you what you you're oppressing me you're not giving me my rights because you kicked me out of my marital home and you don't have a right to do that so after two and a half months he's calling and and asking all of a sudden but if so, but what he what was he hoping for? He's hoping that he's going to call me and say, "Is there a difference of opinion?" Yes, there is, and that's it. And and he's going to run with that, and he's going to go back to his wife and say, "Oh, I called, and uh, and I was told there's difference of opinion on this issue. So you know, uh, you you don't have anything against me. You see." The vast majority of people, unfortunately, that are going and getting these quote unquote fatwa are people who are abusive. They are trying to abuse the religion, okay? So don't give them the chance to do it. And this is why it's very important because as each and every one of you, you get more and more knowledgeable, people will ask you questions. Remember your limitations, remember your restrictions, okay? If somebody contacts you, okay, I'll give you a question, Iram, I wanna get you involved a little bit. Iram, somebody contacts you and says, um, is it uh, allowed for me to um, to pray Fajr early? Uh, I, I I work in a job where I have to leave my house um, very early in the morning at four o'clock to go to my job, and the Fajr does not come until four thirty. Is it okay for me to pray at three forty-five so that I can leave at four o'clock? That way, I don't miss my prayer and I don't get late to my job. Is it, is it, uh, can you answer this question, Aaron? Just let me know if you're, if you're hearing me, if you're not there, then I, I would not want to wait. The Fajr comes at four o'clock, and this person wants to the permission to pray the Fajr at three forty-five. Uh, the Fajr comes at four thirty. Sorry, Mariam, what do you think? Is it is it acceptable for that person to pray Fajr at three forty-five when the adhan is at four thirty? But you, so you're Mariam, you're giving me a fatwa. Are you qualified to give fatwa? Yes. You're not qualified to give fatwa, but is this a fatwa? That's what I'm asking. Is this a fatwa or is this Quran and Sunnah? It is Quran and Sunnah, right? Because the prayer has prescribed time. It's right. Now, okay, it is Quran and Sunnah, good. Now, the next question, is it Qatai Quran and Sunnah or is it Dhanni Quran and Sunnah? So Qatai, it means clear Quran and Sunnah, like it is black and white, there is not two opinions on it. It is one opinion. Or is it Dhanni, meaning speculative? It is Qatai. Okay, so this is not a fatwa. That's an important thing. So when someone comes to ask you a question, okay, and again, the majority of the deen, 95% of the deen is in Quran and Sunnah, and it is, uh, I would say 90%, 90% is Qatai Quran and Sunnah, 90% Qatai. Okay, it is clear, clear, no speculation. Okay, only 10% we're dealing with that is Dhanni. Okay in that neighborhood okay don't quote me on that specific number but i'm giving you a, an idea okay that the vast majority of our deen alhamdulillah is qatai it is clear only a small portion is lonely is speculative and so there only a small part of it is going to get into ijtihad and qiyas and fatwa and all of these types of things so someone who is contacting you to ask you a question that's qatai, clear, definitive, Quran and Sunnah. You, you, you answer them because this is uh, there's there, this is not an this is not an issue of you giving a fatwa. 
fatwa is on is in definitive or speculative? Ishtihad is in the definitive or speculative? Speculative. Speculative only. Okay. This is where there is more than one way of looking at it. This is Dhanni, okay? That there is more than one way of looking at it. There is a perspective here. There is so th that's the that's the stuff we're talking about here. That's the stuff that's fatwa. But the stuff that is just clear, okay, this is you commanding good and forbidding evil. Okay, commanding good and forbidding evil is just knowing the Quran and Sunnah. Right? So you have to know these things. So these are things that you would know. So I know because you know because you studied the Quran. You know, so as we talked about this, Allah Azza wa He said in the Quran, in the salata kanat al mu'minina kitaba maquta. So in Surah Nisa, Allah said that prayer is an obligation upon the believers in specified times. Prayer, prayer is an obligation upon the believer in specified times. Okay. So that means that you have you can only pray in specific periods of time. You can't make up the prayer times on your own. There is a beginning and there is an end. Is there a hadith on this subject that's very clear? On the beginning and ending of the prayer times? What do you guys think? I don't know. So there is a hadith in Sahih Muslim, okay, and, and elsewhere, in which, because we have, Allah says in the Quran here, so Allah is telling us that the prayer is uh, obligatory upon the believers in specified times. And so that ayah by itself is not going to give us the information, right? We just know that there are specific times. What are the specific times? We get that from the hadith. And so the hadith in Sahih Muslim that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, Jibreel came to me. Okay, and he came to me at the beginning of every prayer time and then at the end of every prayer time so that he would know. And so he specified that this is the beginning of the time when you see this, when you see the, the, the light on the horizon, that's the beginning of Fajr. When the sun is, uh, you know, peaked or just the sun reaches the horizon, that's the end of the time of Fajr. And the, the Doha prayer, it's when the uh, sun has risen to the you know certain measure in the sky about 15 minutes or thereabouts uh, then uh, or so the Prophet says hadith and this the distance of a spear in the, in the sky then that is the beginning time of Salat al-Duha and then it goes all the way until just before the sun hits its zenith when the sun hits the zenith okay then that is the time of Duhar and then when the time of Asr is when the shadow is uh, double the uh, the length of the person, and Maghrib is when the you know the 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 end time of the Asr is when the sun has completely set. The beginning time of Maghrib is when the sun has completely set. And then when is the beginning time of Aisha? When the yellow and the red colors go out of the sky uh, and the, the the stars become visible, then it becomes Aisha. So we have very specific things. This is very clear. The Prophet was clear on these things. So you know that. Now this is not fatwa. This is you sharing knowledge. This is you saying, this is what Allah said. This is what the Prophet said. You cannot pray before its time has come. You're not giving a fatwa. You are sharing knowledge of the Quran and Sunnah. So that's very important for you to, to understand. Okay. Um, what are the conditions of the Mufti? We already talked about them. The same conditions of the Mujtahid. Okay, there's really no difference. Uh, some people they said there is a slight difference between the two, but uh, uh, I don't see that there is any difference between the two. The 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 scholar, uh, the Mufti, and the Mujtahid, they all have to be sincere. They all have to be righteous. They all have to have a good reputation. They all have to have intelligence and confidence. And and as, uh, in addition to all the things we talked about regarding knowledge of the Quran, knowledge of the Sunnah, knowledge of the specifics of the, the ayat, knowledge of the tafsir of the Quran, knowledge of the usul, knowledge of the statements of the prophets, uh, of the companions of the tabi'een and the great imams, and the understanding of the um, research that was done by the great imams on on specific topics you know to you know what's the difference why there's a difference between them so the ikhtilaf and the ijma all of this they have to have it okay
this is the conditions of the Mufti. So uh, with that, alhamdulillah, we're finished. And so, as I said, inshallah, I will um, find out if there, uh, what we're doing if next week we begin with uh, the next semester or if we're taking a break and then we start after Ramadan. So inshallah, just uh, stay on the lookout. I will make sure that um, uh, that you get an email and you will definitely get an email from me with the uh, with the slides, inshallah. Barakallahu feekum wa jazakumullah khair. Any questions? Doctor, how about the muftis that, or not muftis, I would say scholars that charge you money to ask a question? Because no, a lot of the ones you say, like the ones go on TV channels, that's actually a charge to ask questions. Yes. And so this is, so what do you think, first of all? I, I mean, I, they might be learned, but I feel it's you charging money. <laughs> it's, yes. So there are certain things that there is no charge for. There are certain things which, and so the sharing of knowledge, okay? So this is an obligation, remember? So if we go back, okay? And so we go back to, you know, the this this um, uh, here, okay? This is the Ishtihad, right? So we talked about it being um, a collective obligation or a, you know, individual obligation. And so this is an obligation, okay? This is, at the end of the day, this is an obligation upon the you know the uh, the scholars they are obligated okay this is the price that they pay you know for having that knowledge is that they share it with the people and so it is uh, it is uh, really a sign of the times that um, we see people these days that they are trading the knowledge of the hereafter or they're selling the the knowledge of the hereafter to for a price of this dunya so this is not something that you know that uh, can be valid now when it comes to teaching uh teaching you know the religion there is some difference of opinion in regards to some people so the way I, i'll tell you for example um my quran teacher okay um you know i've never i've never um he's never asked me to pay him okay he teaches me the quran when i want to learn he teaches me but he never ever asked me for any money, okay? Um, but it's from from kind of like uh, you know um, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He said, um, "Whoever does something good for you, fakafiu." Okay, you should give him uh, a mukafa, which is like a, a a reward or a gift or something. And that gift can be as simple as Jazakallahu Khair. But you know, of course, human beings they want something more. They want something, you know, you know, solid. So for my teacher, I give him. I give him gifts, financial gifts all the time. So every time, like in Ramadan and Eid and things like that, I always you know have some money that I share with him and I give it to him and, and he never asked. He never once asked for me for this. But this is me trying to be, you know, appreciative to him, okay? Uh, and he didn't say no. And so he didn't, if he tells me, listen, I don't want it, you know, I'm doing this uh, 100% and, uh, and I don't want my, my intention to be confused. And of course, I will not give him at that point in time. But I know that he is, he is a, in a poor situation and he doesn't have, uh, you know, a good income. So I try to help him. But so there is, this is the way that a lot of the, you might say the teachers in the past, they used to operate that they never asked. Someone came and they wanted knowledge, they gave them the knowledge. If that person wants to give them a gift, wants to share some food with them, wants to share, um, you know, give them some money or something, alhamdulillah. If they don't, alhamdulillah. They will still teach and they will not differentiate. They will not say, oh, so-and-so, Ali, he pays me, and uh, Sami, he never pays me, so I will give all my attention to Ali and not to say No, has not, he will teach everybody the same. This is the the how they are able to show that they are sincere to the sake, for the sake of Allah. Okay? So if you went to a sheikh, for example, and, and you asked him a question, and he answered your question, and you said, Sheikh, I, I just want to... Uh, 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 I wanted to give you this uh, this dessert uh, to take home to share with your family, as an example. If you want to do it, alhamdulillah, then this is from your manners and from your generosity and your goodness uh, as a, as a human being. But it's it's their obligation, their obligation, hundred percent. They have knowledge; they have to share it. 
and this is something that's not from Islam, you know, to charge people money for something like that. Um, so, so uh, I hope that answers inshallah the question. Yes, thank you. Thank you. You're very welcome. Alhamdulillah. Any other questions on the subject matter? Okay, tamam, alhamdulillah. Um, I know it's late for the you guys, the ones that are in in uh, in, the, in Asia. But if you want, inshallah, in approximately twenty minutes, I will be starting a webinar on uh, knowing Allah, uh, how to get to know Allah better. Uh, if you would like, I will share the uh, the meeting link with you. But I know it's very late for you guys, and probably you're going to make your support and get ready for Fajr. But if you want, I'll share it. Otherwise, I will be emailing you, inshallah, and uh, we are finished for today. Subhanallah. Yes. <laughs> So here I'll I'll email it to you if you'd like. Is that okay? Yes, thank you so much. You're welcome.